from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 87, recorded on December 12th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Paul, your, uh, the title of your uh, substack never had better meaning than now, Beyond the Noise. <laughs> You're right. When as Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said on the Tucker Carlson show that we don't need to trust experts. We can just trust ourselves. We need to stop trusting the experts. Of course. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. And today we are going to talk about Paul's latest column, which is called RFK Jr. We need to stop trusting experts. Now, Paul, is is RFK Jr. serious when he says that? Because would he like Trump to be his surgeon or his airplane captain, for example? Yes, I think he'd be fine with that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Then um, this is really because Trump doesn't know how to do any of those things. We need expertise, obviously. So, I mean, obviously, it's it's an absurd statement to make, right? No, so what he really means is he means he doesn't want you to trust real experts. Um, he wants you to trust people that he sets up as experts because when he fired 17 experts from the ACIP in June 9th who had an expertise in microbiology or virology or public health or vaccinology or immunology statistics, he then replaced them with seven people who don't have that expertise, who he's asking you to trust because they're the ones who are making recommendations. So we have no choice but to trust them. So that's what he means. Trust his experts who aren't experts. Right. So he filled the ASIP with non-experts. I mean, maybe they're expert in something else in their lives, but it has nothing to do with vaccines. And so what did these non-experts in the area of vaccines do last week to the hepatitis B virus va b vaccine birth dose? I think it's the worst thing they've done so far. They met in June where they voted against the thimerosal-containing flu vaccine, which was a non-science vote, but thimerosal-containing flu vaccines is probably less than 4% of the vaccines that are out there for flu, so that wasn't a problem. Then they met in September and basically didn't recommend the COVID vaccine. They said that anybody over six months could get it if they chose to, but weren't necessarily recommended to get it, all shared clinical decision-making. That was a bad recommendation because there are high-risk groups for whom the vaccine should be recommended. Um, and then what happened this time was, was the worst thing yet for children, I think, is what they did was they, um, they didn't fully recommend the hepatitis B birth dose. And in order to understand that, let me start from the beginning. So um, the hepatitis B vaccine was first licensed in 1981. In 1982, the decision was made to give all newborns the vaccine if the mother was hepatitis B surface antigen positive in the first trimester, meaning she was infected with hepatitis B. The reason for that recommendation was that if you're born through a birth canal that contains blood from a mother that has infected with hepatitis B, you have an 85% chance of developing hepatitis B. And if you get hepatitis B as an infant, you have a 90% chance of going on to develop cirrhosis, chronic liver disease, or liver cancer. Um, and so that was an easy recommendation. Uh, but uh, it didn't really make a dent at all on the instance of hepatitis B in children less than 10. So in 1988, they changed the recommendation to include not only women who were infected with hepatitis B, but any woman who was possibly likely to be infected with hepatitis B, like Southeast Asian immigrants, Alaskan natives. Again, really no dent, dent on the instance of hepatitis B in children less than 10. So now you had nine years of, of that, that birth dose recommendation for People who either had were infected, were in a high-risk group, didn't make a difference. So in 1991, they changed strategy and said, okay, we're going to recommend this, this vaccine universally for all babies born in the United States, period. And with that, we virtually eliminated hepatitis B in children less than 10. Now, at the time in 1991, there were, there were at least 16,000 and probably at possibly as many as 30,000, depending on which data set you look at, of, of children less than 10 who had hepatitis B. So let, let's take the 30,000 number. Half got it from their mother. The other half didn't. The other 15,000 didn't get it passing through a birth canal from a mother that was infected. They got it from relatively casual contact from people who had hepatitis B and didn't know it. 
And this is an AIDS virus. I mean, if you live in the house of someone with AIDS, um, you're not going to get you're not going to get AIDS. I mean, the virus doesn't live long on surfaces. It's not transmitted by casual contact. Not true with hepatitis B. It is transmitted by casual contact, sharing toothbrushes or washcloths or towels or nail clippers, even sort of partially eaten food, candies. So. That's and it's fairly contagious. I mean, in in that sense. Mm. So, but with that recommendation, we eliminated it. Now, what what the ACIP just did was they kept the give the birth dose to anyone whose mother's infected, but otherwise, you should delay it till at least two months, and then you could get it or not. And so, we've taken a step back, basically, to the program we had in 1991, or before 1991, from those nine years when it didn't work. We've gone back to that program that didn't work. Basically, and so I think that we're about to see this virus come back in young children. How uh, you've just gone through a lot of data which supports that Hep B is not only transmitted from pregnant mothers to babies, but also after birth from casual contact. So how could ACIP ignore those data? What what compelled them to change this? Well, they got some bad information. There was one woman who stood up there uh, as uh, sort of serving as a quote unquote expert who said that, you know, this this uh, infection, this this so-called uh, horizontal transmission, you know, not from from mother to baby, but from person to person does not really occur for American children, which is just wrong. Of course it does. I mean, when we talk about testing the mother, that's fine. But if you really if you're worried about horizontal transmission and you should, um, then you should test the father. And you should test anybody, really, that has close contact with that baby, whether it's a daycare center worker or a nanny or somebody who's in the immediate or extended family, which nobody does, nor would you be expected to because that's burdensome. So what you can do to get around all that is just vaccinate the newborn. But uh, they didn't do that because we've ended up having to trust RFK Jr.'s experts. Now, to the credit of the American Academy of Pediatrics, they immediately stood up and said, no, this is a universal birth dose recommendation. The, the decision that was just made by the ACIP is a dangerous and misleading decision. So you write in your columns, Cynthia Nevison, who works on climate change and autism, okay, she said that this transmission outside of, of uh, birth doesn't apply to the average American child. Yeah, you've just told us data, which tells us that it does, in fact. How, how can she lie and people listen to her? The problem is that the ACIP, when they make a decision, you're forced to listen to them at some level. And I think, so there's about more than 2 million people in the United States who have chronic hepatitis B. That's about the same number as, as was true 30 years ago. So that hasn't gotten better. Um, and are those people contagious? Just because you have fairly large quantities of hepatitis B virus, mm -hmm. so-called Dane particles in your bloodstream. And, and you can have unseen amounts of blood just from tiny nicks on a nail clipper or washcloth or towel or toothbrush. And and that's how those children got. I mean, think about it. As many as 10,000 children, 15,000 children, roughly thousands of children, less than 10 years of age in 1991, got hepatitis B from a source other than their mother. They weren't sex workers. They weren't intravenous drug users. They were less than 10. And we eliminated this virus. And I just feel we've just taken a giant step backwards. So a person from the FDA, Tracy Beth Hoag, she says the U.S. should be just like Denmark in not giving an HPV vaccine birth dose. What, what's crazy about that? Well, first of all, we're not Denmark. We, we don't have a national health system. We don't have, we're not a homogeneous population. Well, a lot of people fall through the cracks in the health system here in the United States. And, and by having a universal birth dose, you sort of help plug up those, cra uh, those cracks. And um, why are, are we sort of fawning over Denmark? We recommend 16 different vaccines for children in this country. Denmark recommends 10. So there are six vaccines they don't recommend because they choose not to recommend them. So, for example, they don't recommend the rotavirus vaccine in Denmark and have um, thousands of children, at least 1,200 children every year, who suffer hospitalization from rotavirus, um, from severe dehydration. And that's the tip, obviously, of the bigger iceberg of children who suffer. They're, they're fine with that. We're not. We wanted to eliminate the 70,000 hospitalizations from rotavirus, so we have a rotavirus vaccine. I don't know why it is that we look to Denmark as a source of public health mecca. Yeah, in fact, the population of Denmark is about the same as New York City, where I am right now. 
So, so even Trump has said we should be more like peer nations, which he included Denmark in. But it, as you say, it's very different. It's And the public health is very different as well. Also, Trump fully supported that that move to 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 go back to uh, a, a lesser mm-hmm. birth dose recommendation, and he has said publicly that hepatitis B is only transmitted by sexual contact or sharing needles. Hepatitis B is sexually transmitted. Rand Paul has said the same thing all publicly, and that's just wrong. It's okay that, that it's okay that Donald Trump doesn't know that. I mean, he's a real estate developer. But uh, he shouldn't insert himself into a conversation about something he doesn't know anything about. Well, these false statements are endangering the lives of children. This is the big problem here. That's right. And so when does someone stand up in defense of these children? When does that happen? Because we've just standing back and, and continuing to watch this happen. You saw just in the last day or so, there's a massive outbreak of measles in Spartansburg County, South Carolina. They have 254 children who are quarantined in the area away from school. And it's December. I mean, we're heading into winter and early spring. That's when measles generally flourishes. I think this is only going to get worse. So he's the president of measles land. He should care about that. Well, as you probably know, someone in the Congress just introduced articles of impeachment against RFK Jr., but, you know, they will all vote along party lines and not along the, the lines of scientific fact, which is not the way it should be. You're right. And so our children suffer. Maybe it would help if they voted. So despite this recommendation by ASAP, you think pediatricians will still do the right thing? Yes, I think pediatricians will still do, the, still do the right thing, and I think insurance companies will still cover it. I think that everybody will still be encouraged to get the birth dose. I think for the most part, the scientific and medical communities are ignoring what goes on at the ACIP. In fact, a recent survey of 1,000 adults showed that only 13% of them trust the CDC. Right. You have former directors of the CDC, like Rochelle Walensky or Tom Frieden, saying in public they don't trust the CDC, and they were former directors. What are the medical societies saying about this? No, they've all been uniformly standing up for the science, standing up for good science, and therefore good medical practice. So people just hold their breath every time the ACIP has a meeting to see what dangerously irresponsible thing they say next. And this one, this one can do harm. If you get a hepatitis B infection in infancy, in your first year of life, you have a 90% chance of going on to develop cirrhosis or liver cancer. If you get it in between one and five years of age, you have a 25% chance of developing cirrhosis or liver cancer. It's a vulnerable time. That's why we had the universal birth dose. When Donald Trump said, for example, well, let's just immunize children when they're 12 years old. I would say, wait till the baby is 12 years old and formed and take hepatitis B. He obviously doesn't understand those data. So do you think that this change in policy will will result in more uh, children being infected with hepatitis B virus? Yes, because I think the way people will interpret this is that it's safer to give it later. And so I think there will be people, I'm sure there will be people who, who, where the mother is infected with hepatitis B that will still refuse the birth dose because they see the birth dose is potentially dangerous and they don't see the danger of their child getting infected with hepatitis B. I think what we just did when we said, the ACIP just said, delay it until at least two months of age and then it's shared clinical decision making. Why till two months of age? Is the vaccine safer at two months of age as compared to birth or one month of age? They just made that up. And so they've, they've now confused people. And I think that's the goal of this ACIP. I think that's the goal of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to confuse people about these vaccines to make them so, to make it so that they're less used. How much time do you think it will take before we see uh, a rise in uh, hep B infections? Um. I don't think it'll take much time to see hep B infections. I do think it'll take uh, years and maybe arguably decades to see the consequences of hep B infection yeah. like cirrhosis and liver cancer. But I think you you could start to see that soon. Yeah, because ne- you wouldn't necessarily be checking babies for hepatitis B, right? Right. See, the thing is, is, is when, you, when you're an adult who gets hepatitis B— um, you usually develop symptoms, but mm-hmm. as a child in the first couple of years of life, there often aren't symptoms, so you wouldn't notice it initially. So the the symptoms that would alert you would be hepatitis, for example. 
Right. So, so fever, dark urine, mm. uh, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, the kinds of things you see with hepatitis B infections. So let's see if we can have a crystal ball. What will ASIP do next, Paul? I think ASIP will attack aluminum adjuvants. Mm -hmm. I think ASIP will attack the childhood vaccine schedule, thinking it's too burdensome and we need to somehow um, separate or delay or space out vaccines. I think that they, uh, I fear that the FDA is soon going to put a black box warning on COVID vaccines because of that memo that Vinay Prasad put out claiming that the, the COVID vaccine had caused at least 10 pediatric deaths. And when asked for his, for his information, he said, VAERS reports. Well, VAERS reports is no way to determine causality. Let's see what data you have. Let's see those data. And so, you, so he's refused to show those data. And, and he said similarly, you know, that uh, COVID causes deaths in, in vaccine causes deaths in people. And so he's talking about putting a black box warning on this without providing any information to the people who are going to be most impacted by this, which is the scientific and medical world and, and the people whom they serve. It's uh, it's just so unprofessional. It's so dangerous and it's so hard to watch. And we all have to stand back and watch it because we have to watch the, the experts, quote unquote experts that RFK Jr. is making us follow. You know, you mentioned, uh, we, we talked earlier about, uh, Denmark and you mentioned just now removing aluminum adjuvants. Well, in fact, the best study on the fact that aluminum adjuvants are harmless comes out of Denmark. Which I'm sure they will conveniently ignore. Oh, it's not only ignore. When that paper was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, RFK Jr. tried to sue the Annals of Internal Medicine, claiming that they had to take that paper down, but which, to their credit, they didn't do. So they only like Denmark insofar as it gives them ammunition for their misguided policies. Right. Well, actually, one of the early papers showing that MMR vaccine was not associated with autism also came out of Denmark. So. Right. They wanted to ignore that one, too. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes so you can read it for yourself. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 